August 8, 2017, the Maradon Museum here in Butler, Pennsylvania will fill with guests to honor the artistic inspiration of the poet born of fire, Huang Xiang, an international artist and a nominee for the Nobel Prize for Literature. Let's go inside. Randall Giuseppe, uh, one of the collaborators with Wang Chen. Uh, this is uh, some of his work back here. Uh, the calligraphy, the cosmos, and the cosmos, and Wang Chen. How did that come about? It, it started with uh, an evening party where I happen to have a telescope with me. I will look at the night sky every chance I get. I was invited to a, a, a party to his apartment. and. I happen to have a telescope that we broke out in the terrace to look at the mountains on the moon and the rings of Saturn. And he was completely blown away by this. And I told him, we need to get away from the city to take a, I want to show you there's so much more to see. So we went to Fire Island National Seashore where there is no light pollution. Oh, wow. And I had a much larger telescope with me. And I showed him objects beyond our solar system, uh, nebulae and clusters and galaxies. and like myself, I, I don't, I, I don't know another subject as fascinating as that. And Wang Shan was especially taken aback by it. And according to Ling, his wife, she said he stayed up all night thinking about the experience, uh -huh. saying that something to the effect of, in the time that he was in prison, he was denied the night sky because they tell you when the lights go. Maybe there's there no stars, and maybe the moon might have breaks into the cell. But to actually see all of that uh, put him in a place where he wanted to do an object that transcended his usual political uh, trajectory. He wanted something that transcended politics. And the, the fact that we all live under the same night sky, no matter where you're from, seemed like the ultimate unifying subject matter. So we came up with the idea of creating large paintings 
of a cosmic being, which are not very frequent in, in Asian art. Of a cosmic being. Of a cosmic, of a cosmic beings of the, of, of, of the night sky. Right. And what I would do is I would look at an object, a deep sky object, and we, I would derive from that sketch something from my imagination, what I thought it looked like, and I would discuss this with Wang Shuang, and he would write a poem uh, that was in uh, that was in the same wavelength. Uh, so, the, the, and then, is this where the image of these the images, the owl, the owl, the, owl, the monkey? And yes. the nebula. This, That's where that this happens to be a, a, a nebula called C49, also ah. known as the Rosette Nebula, also known as the, the Red Stone Nebula. Uh -huh. I always thought it looked like an Akari, the South American monkey, looking up. And that's not just, a, it's adjacent to another nebula, uh, Nebula N78 down here, which I always thought looked like a pair of crocodile eyes. So it tells a, a story of a primitive creature. Contemplating the cosmos, maybe for the first time, and being sentient. And while this is going on, a predator is looking up at him and has a completely set of pro different priorities in his mind. <laughs> so that story kind of came to be in this way. So the nebulous here, a, a, a branch of the Milky Way galaxy created the branch that the Ahari is standing on as it's just looking up at the night sky and starting to ponder, I guess, its its own being. That's what that's what it would look like. So, no matter how you cut it, it's something that I think we should spend more time looking at, because we spend half of our lifetime under the night sky, and we spend very little time dwelling over it. So this was something to remind us that uh, it's always there, even if the clouds or the light pollution are there. We made it a large scale, because it's just so clear. It should be. It's one thing to look at something uh, through an eyepiece, or to be out in the field look at a potato. We wanted to give a viewer the feel that they're being enveloped by a little thing. And we, we decided to go with 18 pieces in tribute to the Irish composer John Field, who wrote the first piece, the first nocturnes in the early 1800s. Chopin would end up writing 21. We were thinking of 21, but then we just, we didn't want to buy a little of paper, so we went with 18. <laughs> but John Field, the Irish composer, inspired Chopin to write 21 nocturnes, and we call each of these paintings nocturnes. So the uh, nocturne number one, nocturne number two, and uh, these, like the, like the nocturnes of, of John Field, they were uh, odes to the night sky. And it's something that doesn't matter what your degree is, it doesn't matter what your level of education are, it's, it's, it's one of those realms of science and, and even art that are accessible to everybody. You go outside, you look up in the sky, and it's all there for everybody. No matter what your social strata, whatever your political stripe is, we're all under the same roof. And that's why we have considered it such a unified collaboration. And it's something that we probably ponder well beyond our lifetimes, and we've been doing it since the beginning of time and before time, and that was an inspiration. Well, how does it feel here to finally unveil? Started this about five years ago in clay. So then it took about three years uh, to get it to resin, and then another two years to get it into bronze like it is today. So this is a sculpture, bronze sculpture of Yeshi Walma, which is a Tibetan Bon deity of uh, wisdom and protection. And um, it's about three feet high. And it, when we made this, when this was made, at first I made it in clay, and then it uh, had to be cut up in 22 separate pieces, and we had to make 22 molds. And then from those 22, 22 molds, yeah. And then from those molds, we had to pour wax, so we had 22 pieces of wax of this, then we had to reassemble it, then we had to make another mold of that, and then pour the bronze in, melt the wax out, uh, chase the bronze, put the bronze all back together, and put the patina on, in the end, and this is what we have uh, today. So, and it's all, um, uh, it follows a strict coda that the uh, Tibetan Bon tradition 
needs to have in their um, sacred figures. Like I, I made a, a specific effort to pay attention to that so that they will authenticate it, which they eventually did in 2013. Uh, His Holiness, the Menu Treason, uh, the worldwide head of Tibetan Mon uh, Buddhism, uh, met with me and uh, he authenticated it. And um, so I, I wanted to get that, that they would appreciate it fully for what it is, and also that a Western person could appreciate it, just the aesthetics of it as an art piece. So it's really a mix of East and West, and I wanted both sides to be able to engage it. It's the only sculpture in the world of Yeshi Wama, this particular deity. And how, long, how much time uh, uh, did this project take from when you first got the idea to today? Well, it's been five years. Five years? Yeah, a little over five years. From when it started to be here today in the museum. And do you, are, do you have other plans for other images? Uh, whether Buddhism or in other religions to I mean, continue if somebody, with if somebody, sculpture? If somebody came and said that they were interested in having that done, I mean, it's obvious that it can be done. I think it's um, a great way to show that, you know, uh, cross-cultural collaboration and that we can appreciate, you know, diverse cultures that maybe seem a little, uh, you know, alien to us if we really take the time to interpret what they're trying to say. And I do that through art that, uh, you know, that we'll see that there's a lot of connected, there's a lot of connectedness in uh, cultures. So. Well, it, it certainly sounds to me like you've learned a lot about Buddhism. Uh, is, is, do you see Buddhism in your own personal Well, the thing is, this, this is Bond. This is, bond. A, this is the, um, yes, the, bond. the original the bond. Uh, tradition bond. of Tibet. So Bon is not necessarily Buddhism, but it did fuse with Buddhism along the way, and Buddhism borrowed from it, and it has aspects of Buddhism in it. So there's similarities, but they would consider it, you might say it's Bon Buddhism, it's the original indigenous uh, religion of Tibet that they say dates back to 2,000 years. Yeah. Well, so do you see yourself in following along through in that uh, uh, religion, Buddhism, Zen, Bond? Well, I, I think because, because you, you seem to, well, in your own personal way, you seem to uh, be very uh, uh, conscious of it. I think the thing is, is that all belief systems at the core, the mystical core, uh, are where there, there's, there's similarity, there's connectedness, there's sameness. They're all kind of uh, pointing to the same thing. And then they have a different uh, vehicle in order to honor that, that aspect. So. Excellent. Dennis Keyes makes his debut with uh, your wonderful painting. And I'm sorry, what's the, what's the title of your report? Well, I didn't name it. The oh, first, you didn't? No. The first five people that saw it all said, oh my God, what is it? So it became, that became its title. Oh my God. OMG. Oh my God. OMG. OMG. Right. OMG. Right. And um, uh, just a little bit about where this location was. The, 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 the concept of uh, the cave and you know what you saw and okay. what just what what initiated the project well it was in the winter we were cross-country skiing up the rails to trails mm -hmm. the Allegheny, along the Allegheny River we came to an abandoned railroad tunnel the Rockland tunnel and it was freezing cold the ice was dripping down 
forming all kinds of crazy ice formations on the floor. And I got inside and took a few photographs and when I was in there it was all just black and white, that was all you could see. But when I looked at it on my computer I could see concentric rings of color surrounding the entrance to the tunnel, which got me thinking about energy patterns that are not visible, but uh, my camera detector could see it. The, what other energy might exist that an even more powerful detector might see? I thought about the most powerful detector that we know of, the Atlas detector right here. That's this image. Right, that's a CERN in Switzerland, under 500 feet underground in a 17 mile long circular tunnel, shooting protons at each other in opposite directions to create particles. So that's where the whole idea that started the, coming together. Uh -huh. And this is uh, your idea, you started off as a photographic image and then you went into, uh, it morphed into paint, canvas? Well, a lot of different images came in and out of it. I took um, uh, public domain images from the internet, um, took a lot of my own images that I've shot in different places in the world. I just started seeing how our evolving notions of the nature of the universe have changed the more that we learn. The more we learn from science, the more we have to adapt our philosophies and theology to, to the scientific facts. So they, all these digital images started to come together and finally I got to the point where I thought, well, you know what, this is finished, it's making a statement, but it's really small, it's just on my computer and maybe it needs something bigger. So. Uh, got printed on canvas and then overpainted with acrylic. Yeah. It's absolutely stunning. This is my place. There is no other place. The other place of the world, the other place of the world, the other place of the world, the Okay. Oh. <laughs>